Uh, thank you all very much for joining us today. For those of you that do not know me, my name is Ben Spagan, and I am the Director of Operations at the Jefferson Educational Society. Uh, on behalf of the entire Jefferson team, led by our President, Dr. Ferky Ferrati, and our Board of Trustees, led by uh, former Erie Mayor uh, Joyce Savacchio, thank you very much for coming out to a wonderful afternoon presentation. I hope you enjoyed the specially scheduled weather where the rain stopped, so now you can enjoy the tour afterwards. We put a lot of work into that. I'm just kidding, but thank you all very much for showing up. Uh, before we get into the program, I want to ask you and joining me and just taking out your mobile devices and placing them in silent uh, or in airplane mode or simply turning them off out of courtesy for uh, today's presenters. You're going to hear plenty of information uh, about the Letty G. Howard. I don't want to stand in the way of that. And you get the opportunity uh, to have a tour of the Letty afterwards if you are interested in such a thing. Uh, plenty to cover, so I don't want to stand up here too long. But the Jefferson is very excited to kick off its fall term programming. We have 15 lectures happening uh, from now until October 11th. Uh, we invite you to take a look at programs that may interest you, what you'd like to attend. And we hope to see you at the Jefferson soon. For those of you that did not get a chance to pick one up, our fall term brochure is available on the front desk. Uh, it outlines all of those programs, including a special event tomorrow. Uh, I find it's uh, apropos that today we're here in the library, and tomorrow we have an event about libraries. Uh, the executive director of uh, Erie County Public Libraries, Erin Winsek, along with her team, will be uh, at the Jefferson to talk about how libraries are breaking down barriers and building connections in the 21st century, a fascinating topic. Uh, like today's event, that is a free event. The Jefferson offers uh, more than 50% of its programming for free. Uh, we do ask for tomorrow, though, advance registration if you can. Why do I ask that of you? I'm glad you asked. At 6 p.m., we're actually hosting a little reception. Uh, so we'll have some food and some drinks and an ability for you to get to know the Jefferson team as well as those interested in Jefferson programming so that we can order a program Appropriately, we do ask for those advanced registrations. Uh, also coming up at the Jefferson a little bit later, uh, starting on October 29th with a fantastic presentation from David Ignatius, uh, we are kicking off the Global Summit, uh, the hallmark of our programming every year. Uh, for more information about that, as well as how you can join the Jefferson as a member, please feel free to pick up one of the membership brochures uh, on your way out of the event. Uh, again, without the hard work of our entire team, events like today would not be possible, as well as uh, the amazing partnerships we're able to form to give you events like today's. A big thanks to the flagship Niagara League, uh, as well as the uh, Maritime Museum uh, here in Erie for helping us put together this program. Uh, but I'd like to introduce a gentleman who will actually introduce the folks you'll hear from, somebody who's worked tirelessly on this program and we are very happy to have as part of our team at the Jefferson Educational Society, uh, Mr. Pat Cuneo, our Publications Coordinator. So without further ado, please help me in issuing a warm welcome for Mr. Pat Cuneo. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for joining us today. This is a really exciting day for us and, and for the Letty G. Howard and some of the people who are responsible for the Letty G. Howard being here, like Captain Billy Sabatini. Um, you're gonna have a chance to hear from them and their thoughts both about the ship and the great personal history story that Fred Langeal has for us. But before we uh, begin with uh, introductions, I first wanted to thank you again for being here. And Fred has a terrific video, a very brief video, that puts us in the mood to uh, enjoy the program on the Howard. At latitude 42 degrees, 37 minutes north, longitude 70 degrees, 46 minutes west, there is a little village called Essex at the end of the Essex River on Cape Ann. It's evening now in Essex, known now more famously for its fried clams than its remarkable shipbuilding history. For once not too long ago, this basin at the river's end was alive with the sound of wooden schooners being built in support of Cape Ann's famous fishing heritage. Common land was set aside by the parish in 1668 for a yard to build vessels and employing workmen for this end. Topographically, this area was perfect for shipbuilding. You, you built up a very distinctive uh, community of skilled artisans 
and not a few skilled artists in their in their work, who uh, who built uh, uh, ships that were uniquely suited for the fisheries, and uh, of a uniformly uh, high quality. The shipbuilders of Essex built the nation's speediest and most seaworthy fishing craft. The late Howard Chappelle, the 20th century's foremost authority on fishing schooners, wrote that these vessels were the finest fishing vessels in the world and were the pride of their owners and of the northeastern fishing ports from which they hailed. Since the earliest days of settlement, these vessels and the fish they caught and transported fueled the rise of the merchant class in New England, the so-called codfish aristocracy, who became the driving force for the break with England and the American Revolution. Ever honing and refining their technique, Essex shipbuilders created vessels for the country's rapid growth and advancing technology. At one time, shipbuilding technology was uh, one of the highest forms of, uh, of uh, construction technology. Later, in response to safety concerns, designs for Essex-built vessels were altered to create more stable hulls without sacrificing speed. When the Essex shipbuilding industry ceased in 1949, nearly 4,000 vessels had been launched into the Essex River. These vessels employed thousands, fueling the economy of the region while they fed a growing nation. The Essex shipbuilding tradition is still alive and well through the efforts of the Essex Historical Society and Shipbuilding Museum. Mm, what do you picture when you think of the word museum? Uh, you can't touch anything. Stuff you can't touch. What else? Displays. Displays, glass cases kind of thing. Lots of words, wander through, nice art, good display, excellent carpeting, perfect lighting kind of thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, well we have that too. The place where we're gonna be playing today. It's a place of living history, where heritage is not only preserved and presented, but made real. What would be the area of that sale if, you, if we know it's a one inch scale? I think one of the things that makes a difference about this type of learning experience is it's hands-on and it's also out of the classroom. This is more real world, so it's not a purely academic exercise. It's not just theory, it's not something on the blackboard, but it's three-dimensional, they're using their hands, they're getting sawdust in their hair. You know, they're, they're able to build something and see it take place. They're very excited. Partnering with tour groups, school groups, and educational institutions, the Essex Shipbuilding Museum has built a reputation for designing and implementing innovative educational programming. Shh. Lightsaber, this is difficult. So try to make the smoke stay still with your little lights and your little ice thing. We teach science, geometry, right. physics, chemistry to kids of all ages. There are very few places that I know of uh, that have the same type of history and can give the same type of experience that the Essex Shipbuilding Museum can. It gives real world examples of how people can do things and how people can work together. And it isn't the same experience that I've seen in museums where there isn't any interactive activity that takes place. Uh, people can't see the product of their work. People can't understand the living and breathing heritage that is the Essex Shipbuilding Museum. That's a real treasure. The Shipbuilding Museum is vibrant and alive. It's a catalyst for learning, where imagination takes hold, where history becomes real. We expose you to the very things that brought this little village together in the first place. Community, confidence, self-reliance, and achievement. The Essex Historical Society and Shipbuilding Museum. Bringing the history of shipbuilding alive, one person at a time.
Thank you very much, Fred. That was a, a very exciting thing. It reminds us of our own shipbuilding heritage here, and also we were the commercial fishing capital of the world at one time. Um, this, uh, uh, I think, is innate to all of our understanding of the lake shore. It starts with our, our whole history as a lake port uh, city and as a, you know, a U.S. Navy center um, in the War of 1812. Um, one of the key people in uh, uh, Erie right now is not lost on everybody in the crowd, and that, that is Captain Billy Sabatini, who um, is unique in that he's a hands-on man who has worked as not only the captain of the uh, Brig Niagara, is now uh, the top administrative head of, uh, of the flagship Niagara League as its executive director and as the fleet captain. So he oversees the Niagara, the uh, Letty G. Howard, and he, he uh, is himself a Massachusetts man, which he could fill us in maybe about his own uh, life. The Letty G. Howard is a two-masted schooner it's become quickly um, a real main site on our uh, Lake Erie shores and Presque Isle Bay. And from what uh, Captain Billy can tell us, it's already in its short time here, I think it launched in uh, June, was it? It's already been a, a really big success. And it also plays um, a, a key role in our own identity um, and, and serving a practical purpose so that when the uh, Brig Niagara is out of town, we're not left with, uh, without a ship. And, uh, but it's a, it's a beautiful and unique ship in its own right, and we would like uh, Captain Billy to tell us about it and its importance to Erie and to the Maritime Museum. Thank you. All right, so I'm gonna do my best to use a microphone uh, because uh, as any of you have heard me speak before, I don't normally speak with a microphone. Usually I'm pacing around. So uh, I'm honored to be uh, Fred's warm-up act, and uh, a warm-up act should be witty, brief, and easily forgettable. So I'll do my best to do all those things. So, so my name is William Sabatini. I'm now the executive director and fleet captain of the, the flagship Niagara League. Uh, my background is, is in ships. Uh, I started sailing when I was 13 years old on a schooner in Marion, Massachusetts, the Tabor Boy. I did that for all four years of high school. Uh, my summer jobs are also on another schooner, a schooner called Lorinda. Uh, from there, uh, by my senior year, my senior project was rebuilding a 1939 sloop. That uh, was a 36-foot Alden Coastwise Cruiser. So I got to not go to class for the last three months of school and uh, work on my boat. Worked out pretty well for me. Uh, and uh, then after school, I took a year off and went and sailed all over uh, New England on my boat. Uh, then went to Maine Maritime Academy in Castine, Maine, where I got a degree in small vessel operations with a concentration in sail training. So I actually have a degree in exactly what I do, sail training, and that is my passion. And since I've started with the uh, flagship Niagara League uh, and the Pennsylvania Historic Museum Commission, that is really what I've been working towards, is how to bring sail trading uh, to the forefront for Niagara. Uh, Niagara was always a sail trading vessel. Uh, it just wasn't until 2005, which happens to me when I started, uh, that we became a sailing school vessel and started doing it uh, by you know, actually charging people to come out and go sailing with us. You know, and all of this was made possible, obviously, by Captain Ribka, who is in the back row there. So, Walter, thank you. Uh, and in my time here, uh, it's, been, it's been pretty interesting, you know, going through that whole process of, you know, starting with an all-volunteer uh, program to bringing on trainees. I started here as the third mate in 2005, then they promoted me to second mate, I did that for two years, in 06 and 07, uh, and then I left, never to come back, uh, went as, all the way to the Bayfront Maritime Center, uh, was there for about six months, and then they offered me a job again to come back and I was uh, chief mate here for six years. Uh, and then when Captain Harrison uh, left, 
I became the captain in uh, 2014. So I've been sailing the ship, sailing the ship as captain now uh, for the past five years. And you know, just, I believe it was in either May or June uh, when the board decided to make me the executive director. Uh, what I tell people is I really just started that job because I actually sailed for the first two months of my time as executive director. So I keep telling people I just started about six, seven weeks ago. Uh, and it's been an interesting role uh, to be the executive director and the fleet captain. So what fleet captain means is that the captains of the ships uh, actually work for me because uh, the, all the crew are employees of the flagship Niagara League. Uh, Niagara, we still have our senior captain and Walter. Uh, and uh, Letty, I guess I become that, that role for Letty. So in bringing Letty to Erie, uh, that process started 10 years ago. Uh, it started when Captain Ribka decided it was time for another ship. Uh, and he uh, did what he does best. He started writing about it and tried to convince people that it was a good idea. And over the course of the next, you know, nearly you know, 10 years, uh, as things happen, nothing ever happens quickly. So we convinced all the people we needed to convince. We got the permissions that we needed to get. And finally, after going from ship to ship to ship, uh, we started the process of looking for a ship uh, in earnest in the winter of uh, 2014. And it took us that long to find the right ship the right program, the right people to partner with, and we ended up with Letty G. Howard. The, so Letty G. Howard is owned by South Street Seaport Museum and has been there for 50 years now. Uh, they took on the complete rebuild of that ship uh, back in 93 uh, for the centennial of Letty G. Howard. Uh, and they were in a situation where uh, they didn't have a lot of programming set up for Letty at the time, uh, and they were, they were focusing on other things at uh, South Street that it worked out well that they could allow us to use their vessel uh, through this programmatic collaboration. So the lease was signed, the agreement was signed in February, and then we started sending our crew there in April. Uh, it was right in the beginning of April. And we started get, doing the process, taking the winter cover off, uh, making, ship, making sure the ship was ready to go, uh, doing the uprig, and then the process of getting the ship from New York City to Erie was pretty difficult. The, it took about twice as long as I wanted it to take. And I, that was one of the first sort of times that I had to be the person sitting at my desk wishing that the captain was doing something else. And as of course, I second guessed his every single move and called him to uh, give him all the advice that uh, I could possibly give uh, that fits the person who is sitting in Erie, not the person who is freezing to death because it's 40 degrees and blowing a gale uh, in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. So I'm, as, uh, of course, he appreciated every single bit of advice I gave. Uh, I believe that he took all of it in stride and did everything I said. So uh, just don't ask him if that's really what happened. So, uh, so we, we got the ship here. Uh, the hope was to have the ship before Memorial Day. Uh, but it didn't work out. Uh, the ship actually arrived the day after Mariner's Ball, and uh, we had a great, big, great party two nights in a row because of that, so that was a good time. Uh, and then uh, we took about two weeks to get the, the certificate of inspection from the U.S. Coast Guard. So what that is, that document is the, the piece of paper that allows us to take passengers out. Up to this point, Letty did not have a passenger vessel COI. What she had was a sail trading COI, uh, SSV, uh, sailing school vessel. And we wanted to have a passenger vessel. So we went through that whole process. Uh, it was also an arduous process, but we had the inspection, it was done. And on June 14th, we did our first sail uh, with passengers on board. Uh, we took out our, some of our board members, uh, some of the people that made it possible to get the ship here. Uh, and then uh, the next morning, we had our first passengers on the ship. That uh, was a program we did through Sea Grant. And ever since, the ship has sailed, I think, every single day, except for there was one day in Port Colburn, two days in Port Colburn, she didn't sail. But she sailed every single day since. It's over 250, will probably be over 300 sails by the end of September. Currently, we're at about 5,000 passengers total. We had 82 uh, campers because we also started up a tall ship summer camp. 
because even though we brought Letty here to be a passenger vessel to really expand the offerings of the Erie Maritime Museum and give the people of Erie something new and interesting to do, a way for them to connect to the Bayfront, I'm a sail trainer, so I wanted to do a sail training program. So we created the Tall Ship Summer Camp as a way to expand our sail training program to a younger demographic. On Niagara, you have to be 14 to be a trainee. Well, for the Tall Ship Summer Camp, you have to be 10. And uh, we spent the entire summer kind of going through that process, figuring out what that meant. Uh, Marcus is over there. He can tell you uh, just how interesting uh, and or challenging. Those are definitely the words you would use, right? OK, good. Uh, and to create a whole new program like that is something we hadn't done before. Uh, so uh, that program went very well. Uh, the feedback came back that we did a good job. So well done, Marcus. And so we yeah, have created the sail trading program. And in all, so we have 82 of them, over 5,000 passengers, and 1,000 of those passengers are going to be fifth graders because we're taking every single fifth grader in the city of Erie out sailing on Letty. So for the past couple of years, and we started this in 2009, uh, in Niagara, we take all the eighth graders out. So when you have uh, all the eighth graders in the city of Erie going on Niagara, well, what's the best primer for that? Why don't you go on Letty or in fifth grade? So the way the schools work here, fifth grade is the end of elementary school. So on your last year of elementary, you go out sailing on a ship because Erie is a maritime city. Well, when you're done with middle school, you should probably go sailing on a ship again. That's eighth grade. So through taking all of these middle school or elementary and middle school students sailing, we're helping to reconnect who we are as a community. Because although I'm not from Erie, I, I do feel I am a part of this community now. I've been here now for almost 15 years, and I do love it here. But this is our community, and we are a maritime-based community. This, this whole city was started because of the proximity to the water and because of Presque Isle Bay. So by reconnecting our elementary students, our middle school students to that maritime heritage, it gives us identity. It describes what that sense of place is and how we can take that pride of everything that this city is. And I want people to look at Erie from the water looking up. Because when you do that, it changes how you think about the city. When you're always looking down, all you're seeing is big body of water, you know, maybe I go to the beach. But when you're on the water looking back up, you see why people wanted to come here, why it's a perfect harbor, and why they wanted to build everything based off of that. So it's a good way to get a good sense of who we are as a community. So the, the next step with Letty is we're taking her south. Uh, we're going to be leaving on September 30th. And by we, I mean Goldie, Captain Goldman. Uh, he'll be taking the ship down uh, south. Uh, we're heading to Maine first for uh, dry docking. Then from Maine, going down to New York City to go back to South Street for a week so that uh, Letty can go hang out with her friends. Then uh, from there, we're heading down to uh, Charleston. Where we're going to be doing a maintenance period. Then on to Miami, and in Miami we start uh, a program that's gonna, hopefully going to be working out. I hope the, the Mercyhurst people are definitely going to sign this, but uh, we're looking to do a program with Mercyhurst starting on uh, January 2nd, uh, hopefully going out to the Bahamas for about 10 days. Uh, and then we're working with Tall Ships Portland. They're interested in doing some programming with us. We've talked to the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts, and it looks like we have lined up a bunch of different programming for Letty for, to get things going. We're also going to be looking at going into different cities, different school districts, and staying there until they run out of students for us to go sailing with. So the way that's going to work, we come in, we do day sales, we do week-long programs, we do weekend programs, uh, and help other communities reconnect with their waterfront. Our destination is going to be Pensacola, and Letty sailed out of Pensacola for 60 years. And she was actually fishing for Red Snapper at that time. So we get to go back to where the ship was sailing. And then from there, we work our way back up in the opposite uh, way, go back to Miami, back to Charleston, back to New York so she can hang out with her friends again, then up to Maine, and eventually back here to Erie. We should be back here on June 1st for Mariner's Ball. The idea is to actually be here for Mariner's Ball this time, not the day after. And, 
and go about through this whole thing again. We're already gonna, getting things started on uh, talking about what's going to happen for Tallship Summer Camp. Uh, we're going to be lining up the private sales and in the public sales uh, going. And when, I, when we first started this whole thing, uh, it was on the news talking about what this means to Erie. And you just heard me talk about the maritime heritage and all that. But I also said this only works if the community wants it to work and wants to be a part of it. What I said was you have to come down, you have to go sailing in this ship and actually experience it. Because if we don't, it doesn't happen. And I can tell you, people came down and people have had a great time going sailing on their bay. And a lot of people from Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Buffalo, really all over have been coming in and going sailing on Letty. Uh, so it's been a, a pretty good success so far and we're looking forward to keeping it going uh, in the years to come. We definitely have the ship coming back next summer. Uh, and then after that, uh, we have an option uh, to go to five years uh, if both us and Celsius Seaport want to continue this pro uh, programmatic collaboration. So I'm hoping it continues. Uh, I'm also very excited to hear Fred's story uh, because as it was pointed out to me, when I speak, usually it's most of the same stuff. So if you heard me speak before, uh, I'm always talking about sail trading, I'm always talking about sailing, I'm always talking about the Bayfront. Uh, what Fred is going to be talking about is a truly unique story. Uh, it's a story of a family and how that family connection going over over a hundred years and how all that story tied Fred back into the flagship Niagara League through Letty G. Howard and his grandfather. So that's a real interesting story. So hopefully I was witty enough, hopefully I was brief enough, and hopefully you forget everything I say. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Our next guest, Fred Langeel, is also probably not a stranger to most of you. He's a historian, a wonderful promoter of the region and the waterfront, and played a key role as uh, one of the co-founders of the flagship Niagara League, which launched us in, into this new era of uh, appreciating our waterfront a lot more. Most of all, He's a true community treasure. And for a Massachusetts man, and probably a Boston Red Sox fan, are you? Are you? And uh, grew up in Maine and then came here. He's now uh, almost a voice of Edinburgh as he helps them become a better community. But he's our friend and a great honor that he's uh, to tell us the story about his family, friends, and historic connection to the Letty G. Howard. Fred. This is amazing. Somebody actually asked me to talk for 20 minutes. <laughs> Usually, uh, go away. I moved here in 1980 to the benefit of having been invited into the life of Bonnie Borland from Edinburgh, Pennsylvania. We met through, we met through coincidence. And our life spent together for 35 years. You need to oh, I'm sorry. How's that? Am I on? Now I'm on. Thank you. But I thank you for raising your hand because I've got a little housekeeping to do. Number one, I cannot thank the Jefferson Society, any more than anybody else, for picking up on this story and Dr. Ferrati and Pat Cuneo saying, you've got to tell this story. A man from uh, Essex, Massachusetts, uh, Mr. Jim Witham, telling me after I asked him, before I get myself in trouble, what do you think of this story? He says, Fred, you've validated my research and preservation for 40 years by telling this story. We are being recorded by the Community Action Television here in Erie for posterity of this program. We're also being live streamed on the US Brig Niagara website for Facebook. I have relatives all over the country and they're able to watch this as we're going through this. 
How many here watched the eulogies of John McCain? I'm sorry, I'm a registered Democrat. Uh, but in watching those eulogies, the frequently used word was legacy. They talked about his legacy. And I began to think, well, what does it mean? I realized a legacy, fulfilling a legacy, doesn't mean that it's an end, just because he died. And it's about people, places, times, times in their lives, and usually includes things, like boats. I like boats. But the legacy of my family goes back to a man named Angus Langell, who spent about 20 years in Essex, Massachusetts. And the legacy of that family is here with me today, and I want to introduce some of them, and I'd like you to stand up as I do. First, Gail and Benny Martinez, and Margaret and Rick Peters from Ventura, California. <laughs> Two great granddaughters, great granddaughters of Angus. Now I go down the line, my son, my daughter-in-law, Brandon and Liz Langell, and their sons, Wyatt and Owen, from Virginia Beach. <laughs> Going further, my daughter and her husband, Brian Rushing, from Edinburgh. <laughs> Another great-granddaughter great-grandson, and my daughter, Victoria Volbrecht, and her son, Hayden, from Ross Township, Pittsburgh. <laughs> Great-great-grandson of Angus. My sister, Margaret, and her son, Craig, from Gosstown, New Hampshire. Granddaughter, great-grandson. Great-granddaughter, Karen Ray, and her husband, Steve, from Columbia, Maryland. <laughs> Finally, to say the least, great-granddaughter, Marlene Sharon, and her husband, Lud Hallman, from Bangor, Maine. <laughs> These are the connections of the history of the Letty G. Howard. These are the legacy people of the Letty G. Howard. The legacy is being carried on in the lives of these families. I have another grandson and son-in-law, Eric Volbrecht and Ryan, who did not, were not able to come today. There are many others who wanted to be here, but they're in California, or they're in Washington, or they're in Alaska, or Phoenix, and we're all over the world. Lose it again? Is it okay? I looked up, I'm not a professional speaker. I looked up keynote speaker etiquette. It says he's supposed to be humorous about something. I thought, I thought it was humorous that it was amazing somebody asked me to speak for 20 minutes. Get him to talk, get him to shut up for 20 minutes. And in big biblical history, says Jesus sent his disciples back to the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee by ship. He stayed behind to pray. The ship was caught in a storm. And after rowing all night, they saw him walking on the sea. They got scared. They thought they were seeing a spirit. He told them, don't be afraid. He got on the ship. The wind died. They got to land safely. Who built the ship? Who built the ship? What about Columbus? Who built the ship? The Mayflower, who built the ship? Washington crossed the Potomac. Somebody built the boat. It was a ship carpenter. So I'm talking about the doers, the people who actually put that wood together, the things that you saw on the, on the video. Today you're invited to meet the Letty G. Howard. Stories about a ship carpenter, coincidence, connections between the Letty, the Niagara, my family that I'm proud to introduce, the places throughout the United States and Canada, 
The legacy I'm pre presenting is about my grandfather, Angus Langell, a ship carpenter since he was a teenager, just like Billy. He wanted to be sailing. His life, the schooner, Letty G. Howard. Angus was born in River John, Nova Scotia. I'm going to go through some dates and facts here. He emigrated through Clearfield, Pennsylvania in 1879. He was born in 1852. He married Margaret Stewart of Cape Breton in Bath, Maine in 1883. Their first child was born in Bath in 1884. I estimate that they moved to Essex around 1885, 86, something like that. A second son was born in Essex in 1888. They bought a house from his boss in 1892. He became a citizen in 1896. His father was born, my father was born in Essex in 1899. Angus worked for an organization called the Arthur D. Story Shipyard until sometime after 1906, about a 20 year shipbuilding career in Essex. And between 1890 and 1900, the story that you saw in that little movie, they built 76 schooners in that little town in 10 years. They built 400, over 450 ships of various sizes and many schooners in the history of the Arthur D. Story shipyard of about 40 years in his life. I didn't know Angus. I didn't know his story. All the family that have come from all over the United States to hear this story and be on the letty and touch the letty. None of them knew it either. Angus was too old. He died in 1942, before I was even born. I've been involved in living history since about 1973 as a Lexington Minuteman. I was privileged to be on the Lexington Green during the bicentennial in 1975 and 76, reliving that, that history of our country. I began an organization in 1978 because the revolution went to the ocean about that time 200 years earlier. And my thought was to promote the history of the maritime uh, through privateering, which was the beginning of much of our nautical mil military history. I met and became friends with Captain Albert Swanson, who was a uh, retired captain, but he was also in the Metropolitan District Commission in Boston in charge of the Boston Parks Department. He took care of all of the recreational sites, and he was involved in a group that brought a schooner into Boston to be a representative of the fishing heritage of Massachusetts. We worked together briefly on that schooner, and I wish I could remember the name of it. And then after meeting my late wife, I moved here to Edinburgh, and one day I was up in Erie, and I came and crested a hill, and I found this. Here's the Brig Niagara, 38 years ago, 40 years ago, sitting in a cement cradle over on State Street, and rotting away, I'm a Navy veteran, I was offended, and I said, who owns this? And I found out it was the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and my idea is, well, okay, let's build a new ship. And that was my introduction to the community, uh, being told in some respect that it won't work. It'll never happen. I was passionate about living history. And I probably aggravated a lot of people in the process of arguing about the fact that this ship should not die. There's a gentleman named Bill Welch, was a, was a journalist for the Erie Times, and he wrote a story, I think it was in 1981, and I think it was the Pennsylvania Historic and Museum Commission was trying to figure out what to do with that ship, and they had a survey done on it to 
to find out its condition. I found out about it, it was in the newspaper, and I got in touch with Bill and I started asking questions around about this community, about this ship, and what do we do with it? And uh, in the subsequent to that, a very diverse group was, was brought together, and the idea would that be that there would be a community organization to represent what is going to be the future of the Niagara in this community. Hence the flagship with myself and four other men from the community. We were enthusiastic. We pushed it, we pushed it, we pushed it. We argued with BHMC. We were told, well, maybe this, that, that. But anyway, it, it progressed along, and Walter knows what that's like, <laughs> as Billy does. It's, it's, it's amazing what we've come to today, to have what we have today, almost 30 years later, and I'd like a round of applause to Walter Ribka because he was her first captain. And... <laughs> I know Walter hasn't agreed with some of my approach many times, is I'm not necessarily as tactful in many ways. What Walter has done in the 30, almost 30 years that he's been here, coming from Galveston, Texas, is that correct? In the, he, he, he worked on a ship called the Alyssa in Galveston. It was going to be scrapped and he turned that around into another historical vessel in our, in our nation. And he was brought here to Erie, and he spent almost 30 years of his life developing a career representing our community all over the United States and other parts of the world, being a recipient of an award for the Niagara of becoming one of the best training ships in the world, of tall ships community. And I, I can't, I can't, say enough for our relationship and I believe our friendship. Thank you very much, Walter, for what you've done. It is beautiful. In 1990, I decided to find my grandparents' graves. And while driving into Essex, though I'm a man, I stopped to ask for directions. That's all I needed, but it was at a boat shop. That's all I needed, it was a boat shop. I had no more than gotten my name out. I reached out to the owner of the boat shop, and I said, hi, I'm Fred Langell. And he says, your grandfather worked for my grandfather. And there's two books over there written by Dana Story. He was the grandson of Dana Story. This was in 1990. My grandfather had been dead for 48 years. I didn't know him. Thank you very much, Mr. Story. I appreciate that. Yeah, right. Yeah, and off I went. So... On February 1st, Billy and the Niagara League and Walter and the others had a press release. And as co-founder of the League, even though I had been idle in my activity, I was caught up in other things that I just could not deal with that. I was suffering from cabin fever in February in Edinburgh, Pennsylvania, in the Snowville. I got nosy, and I came up. I went to the announcement and learned about the Letty G. Howard coming here, and they referred to it being built in Essex, Massachusetts in 1893. Well, silly, my grandfather and my father was born in Essex. My father was born there. My grandfather, I, I heard he worked there. I didn't know about it, but all of a sudden, it brought back that story about, 18, about 1990. Your grandfather worked for my grandfather. So what happens, I contacted the Gloucester Maritime Museum, and the Essex Maritime Museum was closed for the winter. This is March. And uh, Mr. Harold Burnham, another prominent name in maritime history, directed me to Jim Witham, curator of the Essex Historical Society. Jim told me a story. Uh, I told Jim my story, and he allowed me to come out and go through the archives dating back into the 1800s of uh, the Essex Shipbuilding Museum. And lo and behold, 
as we researched, and it wasn't easy to find, but Jim came up with a book. And this book is a payroll book, handwritten, covers 10 years of the ships being built in Essex, Massachusetts, and up on the top is the Howard. That's the job name. And down in this line of about 30 shipbuilders is my grandfather. And there it is, 125 years later, there's a documentation that my grandfather did, in fact, work on the, on the uh, Letty J. So, one of the other things was, before I got myself in trouble with Dr. Ferrati, Pat Cuneo, in July, I went back out to do some more research. I sat and I said, Jim, be honest. What do you think about this story before I go tripping over my mouth? He said, Fred, if it weren't a good story, I wouldn't waste my time with you. And we went forward from there. I am not a professional historian. I'm not a professional anything when it really comes down to it, other than I've become professional at running my mouth off saying, I think we ought to do this. <laughs> but I went off to Essex and I researched and I found something in that time that really blew my mind. I'm sorry, gentlemen. I showed this to Billy and he said, no, I walked into the waterline building over in Essex and I looked up in the rafters about up by the top here. It's about 15 feet off of the floor. And there it is, the Letty G. Howard, a pennant, 125 years old, that flew on the Letty G. Howard the day it hit the river of the Essex River. And this is a half scale facsimile of that flag. And as we get later on, there'll be more about that. This happens to be my grandson, Hayden, that you met a little while ago, steering the letty. And here's some of what it looked like when they said, frame up in Essex, the whole crew got together and helped put the word in place because look at, the, look at the size and dimensions relative to a man's size. There's the Niagara I found when I moved here. Here's the Niagara today. Here's from the original plans, the Letty G. Howard out of the archives of Essex. 127 year old prince just laying there in a box. And as Billy pointed out, the Letty left New York in May 1st, I think, something like that. 29 days later, alone that I was, I stood on the seawall at the entrance of Presque Isle Bay and watched a ship a life, a, a, a person I didn't know come into my life. And there it is, sailing into our channel. And as she passed by, as I am experiencing right at the moment, it was emotional. I never knew that man. But here's something in my life that directly touched to him. We talk about coincidences. Here's another one. Some of you may know this name. This is a wooden minesweeper, my first ship in 1964 in Charleston, South Carolina. Not my, uh, no sails, no big ropes or anything. But there's a gentleman, Erie, I met in 1982, named retired Admiral Charles Curtsy. He was involved in building this ship. A coincidence in my life when I came to Erie that I would meet a man who put, was responsible for putting some of that wood in place. And, uh, oops, I didn't want to get in there. 
That's my boat. <laughs> and if you notice, look at the name. It's a gift of time. Stop and think of what we have in our lives. It's a gift, and it's all time. Um, one other, here's a verification. This is a application document for US citizenship. But about halfway down, it shows in November of 1879 when my grandfather emigrated into the United States to, to go to work. And he ended up going to Bath, Maine to do that to start. This is a genealogy history of our family from Canada. Mostly 99% or more of the families came out of Nova, out of, uh, Nova Scotia as we were Huguenots. We were kicked out of France. We came across on ships named the Sally. And they started lives as farmers, or they started lives as ship's carpenter, as, as my grandfather became. I've got about, uh, I've researched, I think I've got four linear generations going back to Scotland of ship's carpenters in that one family. But both in that family, paternal and maternal, um, uh, people in the family were uh, ship carpenters. So it's kind of in my blood in, in a way. Uh, my brother is a carpenter, my son's a carpenter, those family and members that are here, their, their family members were carpenters. Um, uh, Gail and, and Margaret, uh, their, their dad was in World War II on a Navy ship, an LST in the Tinian Islands during the war and everything else that was going on over there that his LST was built in Pittsburgh. Coincidences, connections. This is what this story is about. The coincidences and connections of our lives. Is the story different? No. It's unique. And what Jim Witham told me in Essex, you're telling it, Fred. You all have connections to somebody in history. You all have a legacy. It didn't die with somebody 100 years ago, or it didn't die with, with an idea that somebody didn't get fulfilled. It's in you. You're the legacy. It's what you do with it. Here we have a community that... Now, how many people are from Erie? Okay. Do you remember what the Bayfront used to look like? Do you remember the time when coming down from 8th Street on the two dirt path, cow path, you wouldn't come down there at nighttime? It was not a safe place. Look at what the Bayfront has become today because, not because of me, but because of a community, because of connections, coincidences, beliefs, passions, interest to be better. And the generations and the legacies go on. Walter's been here. No disrespect, Walter, but your career has been wonderful. Billy's is here, and there's others with Billy that are going to carry on what you have so wonderfully started for us and have put into place for this community. I hope the community of Erie is, opens its eyes and realize we've got more to tell. Today's the anniversary date of the Battle of Lake Erie. There's going to be a commemorative ceremony at 5 o'clock out in, on the basin. Please attend if you want to. But there's more to Erie than Oliver Hazard Perry or the Niagara or the Battle of Lake Erie or the Wolverine that so many have been, been used to over the years. And to, to try and sum this up and be fair, that I may have gone over my 20 minutes. I don't know. Walter went to college, graduated. Where did he start? South Street Seaport. <laughs> Started his career, right? South Street Seaport. Billy likes boats. I like boats. When I was 10, I grew up on a lake in Waterboro, Maine. And my mom said I could go sailing in this little 12-foot boat and learn how to sail. The guy had asked me, would you like to learn how to sail? Go to ask mom. She said, sure. So I got in the boat with him. It's a lake about three miles long, about a mile wide. And he handed me, he said, sit there. And he put my hand on the tiller. And he handed me a rope and said, that's a sheet. Okay. That adjusts your sail. 
And he says, make it go that way. Go someplace. And then he took a Coke and he sat back and he drank. He didn't say another thing. He says, just don't hit the rocks. That's all he told me. But the man told me how to read the water, read the little ripples, read how the wind was blowing off from that little peninsula or over in that little cove over there, how to go find that air. Move the tiller. Turn your steering wheel, because otherwise you're going to run into the rocks. He taught me how to feel the wind. Feel where it's coming from. Be aware of where it's coming from. Watch your sails. Watch the tools that you have in hand. And I think I didn't become a professional sailor like Billy or Walter, but I've sailed the worst, second worst storm on Lake Erie in tornadoes that came up from Detroit and Toledo. I was out there in the middle of it on a 38-foot boat. It was, it was, it was a ride. My thanks to Captain Billy Sabatini for bringing an additional and expanded vision and management to the Niagara and the Niagara League. I hope his years in Erie and conviction and to the interpretation of our maritime history will be here for many more. You've set a, you, Walter, you've, you've set a high standard. You've, you've, you've put a challenge out to Billy. No question about it. And to the Jefferson Society for having the vision to start something where people talk about things. Programs like this, where the community comes together from all over, you don't know each other, as some of you do. We talk about things. Things like that book over there by the Bowers. A 100,000 mile journey all over the United States, our towns. What's the last town in the book? Erie, Pennsylvania. Talking about the amazing social integration, the international integration of people coming from places all over the world to Erie, Pennsylvania to try and live and have a life. So I appreciate the opportunity from that. For the flagship Niagara League in being our host and taking my family from all over the United States, sailing on a ship yesterday that they had never seen before, no different than I, when it first sailed into the channel. And yesterday, in the rain, sailing on the Niagara for four hours out in the rain and the wind, learning what it was like without engines and strictly hands and manpower, woman power, to maneuver that ship in the tight confines of the bay. Finally, the staff of the ship store, the Niagara, the Letty, the museum, thank you. And most importantly, I want to thank Cat TV for documenting this hour-ish and helping getting it out to some of the people all over the United States that couldn't be here. I want to thank my family for being here, putting up with me talking again. <laughs> so that having been said, I want to close about this story, Meet the Schooner, the Letty G. Howard, built in 1893 in Essex, Massachusetts, at the Arthur D. Story Shipyard, a ship carpenter, Angus Langell his life and family, we're his legacy. Coincidences and connections that go between Erie, and bear with me for a moment. Pictures taken by my sister Margaret of Bath, Maine, where the Niagara was in. Going back to 1982, pictures of the USS Constitution members being here for what we called the first Perry Day ceremony in 19. 93, uh, um, yeah, uh, no, 1983, the co connections between Boston and, and Erie are solid. And then here in 1993, here are tall ships from all over the world sailing into our community in Erie and coming here. It's, it's been an amazing experience and here in Pennsylvania Heritage is Walter Rivka's story. 
and all of the things that he's done. Coincidences and connections. People, places, times, and things. That is history. But it's the people who fulfill the legacy. Thank you. Thanks, Fred. Yeah. That's great. Thank you very much. Hold on. Thank you. Fred, Fred, I think you need to shut yours off, maybe. For this <laughs> Hello. Well, thank you very much, Fred and Billy. And we're going to have a very brief uh, a question and answer. As soon as we do a, a quick presentation, if you notice this old tool right here, uh, Fred can tell you this real quickly about where this came from. Here I have a tool. And I was excited about it because it had been hanging around a barn for a all of my life, and my brother, older than I, verified he's seen it all of his life. It was called an ads to us. And I showed it to Lisa uh, Adams here at Channel 12, and Billy was there. And then Jim with him says, no, nah, Brad, he says, that's a grub hoe. <laughs> so Jim with him, my new dear friend in Essex, says, Let's get you the right tool. Those, in one of those little film portions, you saw a guy going like this to a piece of wood. That's what this does. It's extremely sharp. It's meticulously taken care of by someone who knows how to sharpen them. And it's adjustable to the individual's stature or the angle you want to get at cutting away on those frames frames that are like this, that you've got to smooth out and make happen. So, through Billy, presented to the schooner, Letty G. Howard, built in Essex, Massachusetts in 1893, in honor of Angus Langel, 1852 to 1942, the shipbuilders of the Arthur D. Story Shipyard in Essex, Massachusetts, from the Essex Shipbuilding Museum and Historical Society and the descendants of Angus Langell. And what's truly fascinating about this is the fact that this actually could have been used to build Letty G. Howard. I mean, that just blows me away that this could be a tool that was used to build that ship. And then I saw Linda up there. I can't actually use this, right? Is that how it works? I mean, it's not accessioned yet, so I can use it until it's accession. is that? I can't remember. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Fred. This really is amazing, and this will stay with Letty. Uh, even past when uh, the flagship Niagara League is using Letty G. Howard, uh, this will stay with the ship. Thank you. You're welcome. Um... The amazing thing about that too, and I know Jim Witham would, would absolutely put his, his, his cred credentials on the line to say that is a tool from 1893, before or after, uh, but it was probably used on the Letty, the Morrissey, and many other ships uh, that are still plying the waters of New England and the East Coast in most cases. This next one, as I showed you a picture of that, that twilight zone moment, I walked into the that waterline building and saw that a 20 foot long pennant that would have been on the top of a mast that was temporarily put on the letty when it was slipped into the water. The letty wasn't rigged and none of the boats were rigged in Essex. They were rigged in Gloucester and then but to the special uh, um, attention of their captains or their owners who in many cases were the captains. This is a one-half size facsimile to the best of my ability uh, with the font and coloration and design of that pennant. And it's my gift to the Niagara League and the Letty as she 
for the travels, and that can be hung up someplace on the ship or on the gangplank that goes onto the ship, because right now, as you might see when you come down the bayfront, the flagship Niagara, you know, the Erie Maritime Museum, and I haven't seen a banner, it's Letty G. Howard. Right, well, there it is. That's it. And finally, for those who just want to look through a little bit of my amateur collection, these are magazines and books that I've been collecting since 1976 that all refer to Erie or ships or the connections of that history and everything. So you're welcome to come up and look them over because there's some interesting stuff here. Great. Thanks. Thanks again, Fred. In our audience are uh, Jeannie Baker and Donna Wood with uh, microphones in case you'd like to, we're gonna run a real brief uh, Q&A. And I'll, I'll kick it off myself by asking uh, Captain Sabatini, what's, what's it like to sail? What's unique about the Letty Howard, say compared to the Niagara or any other uh, ship? So in my, my brief time sailing Letty, one thing I've noticed about her is how smooth she is. The way she just cuts through the water is truly amazing. Uh, I got to go sailing on Letty uh, just a couple weeks ago. Uh, I had a friend in town and I said, hey, why don't you, let's go sailing. And we went out there and... <laughs> and you just get out there, the sails come up, she lays over just a little bit and just starts kind of slicing right through. Now, Niagara is a beautiful ship, and I love Niagara. I've been sailing Niagara now for 14 years. Niagara doesn't exactly slice through anything. Uh, she's kind of a barge. Um, she's a bit beamy. Uh, Letty really kind of just goes right through the waves like they're not even there. It was, it was very beautiful to uh, be back on a fishing schooner. I did that before in my life, so. Questions? A question for the captain. Um, as with everything, there are financial considerations with bringing a ship like this here, and I was curious to know, given the uh, public input and the people coming out for the sales, if uh, you're meeting expectations. Yes, yeah, I'm sorry. Like I said, I'm not used to using microphones. That's why it sounds like I'm whispering. Uh, yeah, we're, we're meeting expectations. Uh, things are going well. Uh, I'm very happy. Uh, with the performance of, of the ship and the amount of people that have been coming down and sailing. Uh, it's going well enough that uh, we are doing it next year. Who was Letty G. Howard that the ship was named after? The, the Letty G. Howard was commissioned by Captain Frederick Howard of Danvers, Massachusetts, and it was named after a daughter, Letty Gould Howard. And um, there is a profile of the ship uh, on the South Street Seaport Museum. It tells all about the Letty, tells about its history. And one of the things that, again, is coincidental is, was that I was provided from Essex a document of about 50 pages of researching the name of what was at one time considered a vessel named the Mystic Sea or the Caviar. And in order before the South Street actually purchased the Letty, they had to document it out. What is it? Who is it? And there was only in that it, months of research, one book in Florida in a uh, shipyard that had a relative reference to a ship that had had some work done on it. It was a Letty G. Howard and a ship that was known as, I think, the Mystic Sea at that point. No, maybe it was a caviar. 
But um, that was the only reference, and it could have been missed. But that was the, enough for the people to take to the board of the South Street Seaport to say, that's the Letty G. Howard. And that's how it, it got, its, got her name back onto the ship. And that's, again, that coincidence, that connection to history, that it could have gotten lost because they would go into a dry dock or into a shipyard. Uh, they'd be out for months or weeks at time. And anyway, uh, down in the Caribbean, Caribbean waters is not really the greatest for wooden boats at that time, so they got a lot of maintenance attention. So that, that one page could have been lost, and the man that had that page was in the hospital at the time. He was on his way out. Any other questions? Hi, uh, I know a lot about beard grooming. If anybody wants any questions about that, <laughs> anything, all right. Well, thank, thank you very much. And uh, for those who want to take a tour of uh, the ship, if you could just go out to the front and check with our ladies, they'll, uh, they'll put you in groups. So thanks again. Thanks for coming out. Thank you, sir. Thank you.